gentlemen, I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of AFA's Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Aerospace Nation series. We're really pleased today to have two very special guests, Mr. Jim Bridenstine, Administrator of NASA, uh, and General Jay Raymond, Chief of Space Operations, United States Space Force, and, Bra and uh, Administrator Bridenstine Stein, uh, leads NASA in advancing America's aeronautic, science, and space exploration objectives, including NASA's return to the moon with the Artemis program, commercial resupply for the International Space Station, and development of the X-59 quiet supersonic aircraft and the X-57 all-electric aircraft. General Raymond is the Chief of Space Operations, the United States Space Force. In this role, he serves as the senior uniform officer responsible for organizing, training, and equipping of assigned U.S. Space Force. Welcome, Administrator and General, and thanks very much for taking time uh, to join us today. It's uh, my honor. It's proud to be here. Thanks. Now, I think both of you would agree with me that it's been a, a year for the history books for American space ex experts. Uh, Administrator, I congrats to you and the NASA team for the spectacular launch, flawless mission and safe return of American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. Thank you. And General Raymond, congrats on approaching the one year anniversary of the establishment of the US Space Force as our newest branch of the armed forces. Now, given NASA's rich history of collaboration with the Department of Defense, I'd also like to extend my congratulations to your two organizations as you've, as you've just signed a new memorandum of understanding between the U.S. Space Force and NASA on areas of cooperation and collaboration. So let's kick things off by giving you both an opportunity to make a few opening remarks, including details about that new agreement between NASA and the Space Force. Uh, and uh, so why don't we kick off and begin with uh, your perspectives on NASA, Jim. Uh, you bet. Thank you, General Deptula. It's great to be with you. Great to be back at the Mitchell Institute. Um, and of course, you know, I wish we could all be doing this in person. But um, uh, given the conditions, uh, I think this is a great opportunity to, to be able to talk to the national security community in, uh, in a meaningful way. Um, I will tell you, you know, as the NASA administrator, when, when I talk to, you know, the man on the street or the woman on the street, um, a lot of people ask me about the Space Force. They, you know, they, they say, so how's the Space Force coming along? And you know, congratulations on the Space Force. And um, a lot of people conflate the two. Um, and, and I think it's important that, uh, that people understand there is a big difference. Our mission sets between NASA and the Space Force are very different, but we share a very similar, in fact, we share the same domain and we're, we're operating you know, um, in, in the same environment. Um, so there's a lot of synergies, a lot of overlap. And of course, um, when we think about the Space Force, we think about the history of, of for example, um, Air Force Space Command, which NASA has had, you know, a, mem a memorandum of understanding with now for years. Um, and what we do today, <clears throat> we're up updating that memorandum of understanding so that it is now with the U.S. Space Force, which is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic thing to do, and I'm very proud of the teams for for getting together and and making it happen. Um, you're probably aware I was a big advocate for the Space Force when I was in the House of Representatives. Um, we we worked really hard to get the bill passed years ago, um, and ultimately uh, it 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 got through the House with 344 bipartisan votes. Uh, it stalled out in the Senate, um, and then, of course, recently uh, it was it was created with with bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate, and 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 of course signed by the President of the United States. Um, so so where NASA is, you know, we, when we think as a national security community, and I do think, you know, NASA plays an important role in national security. We don't do defense. We don't fight and win wars. That is not our that is not our role. Our role when we think about the elements of national power. Uh, the national security community talks about dime, diplomatic power, information power, military power, economic power. NASA plays on the diplomatic side in a very robust way. 
So for example, on the International Space Station, we have, we have 15 different countries operating the International Space Station. We've had astronauts from 19 different countries on the International Space Station. Um, we've had experiments from over 103, I think it's 103 now, it might be more now, um, 103 different countries have had experiments on the International Space Station. So this is really a tool of diplomacy for the nation. Um, and as we go to from low Earth orbit to the moon under the Artemis program, we're putting together a coalition of nations um, that, that are going to go sustainably to the moon under Artemis. Um, Artemis, of course, in Greek mythology, is the twin sister of Apollo. This time when we go to the moon, it's not, it's not just a technology demonstration. We are going sustainably to the moon to deliver science and exploration capabilities in a way that's never been done before. And we're going for the first time with a very diverse, um, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women. <laughs> in Greek mythology, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. Um, and so I think this is a unique time in American history where we can go sustainably to the moon. Um, I will tell you that given the challenges that exist in space, um, it is necessary to have security. And that's why it is so important for NASA to, to work side by side with, with the Space Force. So where do we play? We play on the diplomatic side, for sure. Um, by the way, we have currently uh, uh, over 700 active agreements with nations all around the world. That's an amazing tool of diplomacy. Now that's of course for science um, and uh, robotic missions to Mars and deep space and astrophysics missions, things like that. Then we have, um, you know, on the information side, when we think about the power of information, you know, we, we remember, for example, you know, just a, a year ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, the first of six moon landings. And I will tell you, we, we had over 500,000 people on the National Mall celebrating this achievement that was done 50 years ago. It was, it was a huge event. Um, and and, and what's, what's amazing about it is it was celebrated all over the world. And, and, and when Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, it was seen and heard by everybody on the planet all at one time. That's an amazing tool of, of, of American power to say, look, you know, we have a challenge sometimes. Back then, it was about reaching behind the Iron Curtain in the former Soviet Union and communicating to people about the values of, of Western democracy. Um, today, we think about landing. We landed Insight on Mars. It was one of the first missions that I got to participate in as the NASA administrator. It was a lander that um, it was the, the eighth time in human history that we've landed softly on Mars. The United States of America is the only country that's been able to do it. And it received, you know, front page news. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if it was front page news, but it received news in Tehran. And 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 the, the, the publication said uh, very specifically, it was the the hardline newspaper of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran. Um, that is not an organization that generally says anything nice about the United States of America. But in this particular case, they talked about you know landing on the moon for the eighth time in human history. And in the article, it, it talked about our international partners that were with us. That's the kind of reach that has the ability to change the perceptions of young people all over the world towards the United States of America in, in, in a way that only really NASA has that ability. So, so we think about diplomatic power, we think about information power. On the military side, that's not where we are, that's not what we do. Uh, of course, there's a lot, we share an industrial base and things like that. Of course, on the economic side, we play very strongly, very, very strongly there. Uh, we're, we're commercializing low earth orbit with commercial crew, which as you mentioned, General Deptula, we just saw launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. That represented a three and a half billion dollar investment by the American taxpayer, but it was also a public-private partnership. NASA wants to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace for human space flight and low Earth orbit. Uh, and we, we also want to have numerous providers that compete against each other on cost and innovation, driving down costs and increasing access. 
So it's, it's, it's commercially resupplying the International Space Station. Now it's commercial crew to the International Space Station. The next big thing is commercial space stations themselves. And of course, we're gonna land on the moon commercially. We're applying the business models that have worked uh, to achieve the, the objectives that we've already achieved. We're applying those to the, to the next big leap. And of course, that is going sustainably to the moon um, and, and learning how to live and work on another world for long periods of time and then going to Mars. All of these missions are focused on diplomatic power, information power, economic power, um, and, and, and building that economy around a very valuable resource, which is microgravity. And certainly there's you know, lots to say on that. That would probably be an entirely separate kind of discussion. Um, but but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here at the Mitchell Institute. What I, what I hope people take away from this discussion today, I hope people take away that NASA, yes, we do science, exploration, discovery, we develop outer space, but, but I really hope people take away that we are an instrument of national power. It is soft power, it is diplomatic power, it's information power, it's economic power. But what we can't do is we can't do any of those things if space is not secure. And that's why it was important to create the Space Force. That's why it's important for NASA to partner with the Space Force on a lot of the things that, that we're going to partner on. And, and we're thrilled to have this memorandum, memorandum of understanding that, um, that uh, General Raymond and I just recently signed. And we're thrilled to highlight it here today at the Mitchell Institute. Thanks very much, sir. Really appreciate it. And uh, with that, um, uh, over to you, General Raymond. Thank you, General Deptula. And, and uh, let me just say how great it is to be here this morning. I, I too wish uh, we could be doing this in person, but I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity that the Mitchell Institute has provided us to, to talk about what I think is really, really important uh, for our national security and for our country. And I would also like to say it's a real privilege and honor to be here with Administrator Bridenstine. Uh, as I mentioned in kind of our little lead up, it's a heck of a lot easier being with him when I'm not testifying in front of him as a congressman. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, he's a great partner. And uh, I was really thrilled, really thrilled to be able to be uh, down at, at uh, Cape Canaveral for the not too long ago launch of, again, as you mentioned, U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil. And I'll talk a little bit about this in my talk. We, we, have, we had a small role in that. Uh, but to see the excitement of the nation of, of, uh, was, just, was just a real thrill. And I, I want to congratulate uh, the administrator and, and all of NASA for the great, uh, great uh, advances they've made here over the last couple of years. Uh, I also know that Administrator Bridenstein would agree with me uh, that this is really a defining, a defining time in the United States, especially as it relates to space. And our spirit towards this time should be uh, an expansive push for American leadership in all sectors of space. And I'm pleased to, to say that that's exactly what we're doing today. And, and I think it's important, as, as the Congressman, or as Administrator Brian Stein said, um, uh, that we are distinct in our missions. Uh, but in every sector, whether it's national security space sector, whether it's civil, uh, which is think United States Space Force and, and United States Space Command, civil sector, think NASA or commercial sector. And this is a really bad term to use when you're talking about space things, but the explosion of commercial space companies and technologies, uh, it's an exciting time to be in our business across all of those sectors. And I will tell you that, um, uh, that, that our nation is the strongest when all of those sectors uh, are leading the way. And again, as I mentioned up front, uh, we're doing so. And I would, I also say that, you know, I was a young kid. Uh, I, my dad was uh, in the army. We were he was stationed. He, was a, he taught at West Point, and I remember uh, as a very young child sitting in our living room watching man uh, walk on the moon and being inspired. And I think that today, with all the activity that's going on in all the different sectors, uh, we're gonna that that uh, young folks in our nation are going to be equally inspired today. And I think that's going to be a really good thing for for all of the sectors of. of Space. And you look at um, folks that are applying for astro engineering degrees and at universities across the country is up. We have people knocking on our door uh, asking us how to get into the space business, the space force. Uh, we have way more people knock on the door wanting to come in than we can than we can take on our books. And I'm sure uh, I don't want to speak for Minister Brian's but I'm sure there's similar similar things happening in his organization as well. Um, I think it's important that we understand this is. Uh, 
Minister said the difference in our mission sets were there. They, it is a different mission set as the nation's newest branch of the armed services. We are all about uh, our national security space enterprise, making sure that that our nation and our joint and coalition warfighters have the space capabilities that they need uh, to provide advantage to our nation. Uh, we've done this for years. Uh, we, we operate capabilities like uh, GPS satellites, like communication satellites, weather satellites, missile warning satellites to detect any missiles uh, that might threaten the United States, space domain awareness satellites to, to have a better understanding of what's going on in that domain. We, we share that information broadly, uh, including with, with NASA. Uh, we integrate these capabilities into everything that we do as a joint and in, in coalition force. And what's new today is that we also have to protect and defend those capabilities to make sure that the domain is, is safe and stable. Uh, NASA, on the other hand, as is, is, uh, Mr. Brian talked about, is in the science and technology and exploration and interplanetary types of missions, uh, aeronautic types of missions. Um, and so they're, they're distinct, but we operate in the same domain. We operate in that same space domain. And if you look at what we share, the common areas, I mean, we share partners, you know, uh, administrator talked about the partners that they have. We have developed significant amount of partnerships in the national security space uh, business. We share some of those partners. We share an industrial base. We share the, the desire to have a, a domain that's safe for all to operate in. We share the desire for security uh, in space. We share R&D. We share science and technology. We share roadmaps, if you will, for for things that would be of benefit for both for both of our organizations. And so this MOU that we're signing today uh, reiterates the close collaboration that we've had with NASA uh, since the beginning. I mean, if you look at it, uh, we have had uh, a very strong uh, partnership. If you look at the Mercury 7, uh, all of those Mercury 7 astronauts were military test pilots, every single one of them. Uh, in, in 1958, when the U.S. Air Force Academy was established, they established the astronautics program. We've had 42 different graduates from the Air Force Academy that have gone on to become astronauts. Uh, we partner in space situational awareness. We have NASA representatives on our operations floor. One of the, one of the thousands and thousands of objects that we track, and the most critical object that we track, is the International Space Station, making sure that we can keep that asset safe uh, and protect the astronauts that, that uh, call that home. Um, we, we operate, we sit side by side with NASA, providing them information to make sure that we do that, to do that well. We uh, provide range uh, support at our launch ranges, both at Vandenberg and, and at the Cape. And I mentioned the, the launch of, the recent launch of uh, humans, astronauts from, from the Cape. Uh, you know, we worked very closely with NASA to be able to do that and to do that safely. On the other hand, we also uh, had rescue forces that were under my command at, at the time when I was the U.S. Space Command commander to make sure that we could protect those astronauts if something uh, or if something were to go wrong. Uh, so we uh, we provide weather uh, weather support to NASA, space domain awareness. I mean the the partnership is really really strong, and and we're excited to continue that and to enhance it uh, even more going forward. Uh, the MOU is just another uh, step in in reiterating that partnership and to expand that partnership, especially if you look at uh, the U.S. Space Command mission set and the AOR for U.S. Space Command. It says that the AOR for, for that command is 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface globally and outward. And so our domain that we have to organize, train, and equip for and to provide capabilities for U.S. Space Command to, to conduct its mission goes well beyond GEO. And as, as NASA explores uh, out uh, and, and, and gets to the moon uh, and eventually gets to Mars, uh, we think there's really some common uh, collaboration uh, efforts to be had between the two of us. Um, and with that, I think I will just conclude by saying uh, it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to, to, to be on the panel with Administrator Brian Stein. Uh, we are very proud of the partnership that we enjoy. Uh, I think having three sectors of space uh, uh, national security, uh, civil and commercial, all leading the way globally is really, really important to our nation, adds strength to our nation. And I am sure that uh, I can guarantee under my leadership and, and partnership with Administrator Brian Stein, this partnership will only grow closer as the, in the years ahead. And with that, uh, General Dep Tool, I will turn it back to you and uh, take it for the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the uh, time. Well, thanks uh, both of you for those remarks. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper into some of the topics that you hit upon, and I'm sure our audience is uh, interested to hear about in more detail. Uh, both of you touched upon uh, collaboration. 
uh, both the NASA and the Space Force conduct research and development efforts for space systems and technologies. You conduct ground ops that support our national objectives in space. And you both operate on orbit systems. So uh, tell us a little bit about how NASA and the Space Force deconflict your roles and responsibilities in these areas. Jim, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the, the big thing is um, what NASA's job is, um, is science, discovery, exploration. Um, and so as, as long as our missions are focused there, I think, I think there's, you know, we, that's, that's where we play and that's where we do really, really good work. Um, it is also true that the space domain is becoming more challenging. And, you know, those challenges affect NASA, just like they affect commercial operators, just like they affect NOAA, for example. Um, and that's really where um, we rely on the Space Force to be to be supportive of what we're trying trying to achieve. Um, you know, we, we think about, you know, proliferating technologies um, like jamming and spoofing and, you know, using, you know, laser energy for dazzling um, and, you know, hacking and these kind of things that that affect pretty much everybody in the space domain. Um, the, the question is, um, what, you know, how do we attribute those things that are happening in space? I think getting to that attribution piece is, is critically important, and it's very difficult when it comes to space. And of course, one of the things that, you know, we're, we, we see in the future is, you know, when, when something strange happens to NASA, we're going to be sharing that data. <laughs> we're going to be sharing it quickly. Um, and of course, that of course has has been true in low Earth orbit and all the way out to geostationary orbit. Um, but you know, the next big thing is you know cis lunar space and and the, the, even the lunar surface. Um, we 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 want to see you know behaviors um, improved in space. And so that's really a I think. From a from a national security perspective, there's there's two ways of doing it. One is, you know, no kidding, hard power, which is what the space force is all about, and then two is soft power. So I'll I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, you know, the Artemis program is is the envy of so many nations around the world. We had a, a meeting the other day. We invited countries to come. Who wants to be with us when we go to the moon? We had 26 nations show up. Some of them didn't even have space agencies but they want to be with us on the moon and, and we want them to be with us on the moon. This is a tremendously valuable diplomatic tool. And so, so we, we decided when, when we saw the level of interest and enthusiasm that we could use this as, as a tool to compel behaviors in space that would be appropriate for a spacefaring nation. Um, and, and a lot of those behaviors are already enshrined in the Outer Space Treaty, for example, um, and they're, they're agreed to with conventions like the Liability Convention and the Registration Convention. Um, and, 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 but not all, not all international players are as good at adhering to those agreements um, as, as, as we would like them to be. So look, if you wanna be with us when we go to the moon, if you wanna be with us on the Artemis program, we want you with us. But we also need you to agree to basic norms of behavior. <laughs> And those basic norms of behavior are ultimately what will preserve space for humanity to continue doing the exploration and development and the building of commercial capabilities. Um, so, so I think we play really on that diplomatic side. Uh, and, uh, and I know, and I'll let General Raymond talk about it, but I know he um, is working with partnering with, you know, national security institutions around the globe to make sure that space is secure um, on the national security front as well. So I think it's, I think we need all of the above. And of course, I think there's going to be eventually a merging between, you know, between what NASA is doing on the civil space side, what the Space Force is doing, like what are the norms of behavior that, that all nations need to abide by in order for us to be able to sustain space for the long term? 
General Raymond, I'll, I'll let you answer. I, uh, I first of all, I, I agree with, with everything you said. Um, I, and so I had listened to the question, I hear the question, uh, John Deptula. My, my view is the deconfliction part's relatively easy. It's that, you know, there's a, there's two distinct mission sets. And so you really don't have to work all that hard to, to, to deconflict uh, activities. I think the, the inverse of that question is where we are really focused on uh, with two distinct mission areas, where do you collaborate? And I think what we have uh, come to understand over the course of decades is, is that there's way more areas to collaborate uh, than there are areas where you have to deconflict. And, and you know, um, I think norms of behavior is one of those. We, we share the same, the same uh, goal of having uh, norms of behavior to, to drive safe and professional behavior in the space domain. We're working that very, very closely with the partners. Partnerships, probably one of the things I'm most proud of in the first uh, uh, nine months of the existence of U.S. Space Force is just how far we have come on developing partnerships with, with, our, uh, with our allied partners and, and you know, the robust space domain awareness sharing agreements that, that we have. In, in the case of NASA, it's way more than just sharing data. As I said, we sit on the floor together. We, we, we do the, the analytical work together. It, it's a partnership that is really, really tight to make sure that we can protect that most valuable asset of, of the ISS. And so, again, I would say that it, the deconfliction uh, isn't that hard uh, because it's two distinct mission sets. Uh, but you know, if you look at R&D and technology roadmaps and S&T and partnerships and, and the need to understand what's going on in the domain, the need for norms of behavior to keep the domain safe for all, there is so much there that's ripe for, for collaboration that would be a benefit for both organizations. And that's really what this MOU is focused on. Oh, very good, thank you both. Now, a related issue involves responsibility for dealing with the Outer Space Treaty, like uh, the administrator uh, mentioned. Um, for those of you who are not that familiar with the treaty, bottom line is it makes countries responsible um, for their actions in space, and it, it prohibits national appropriation of areas in space. So is there a shared role between NASA and the Space Force in holding other players in space accountable? Um, uh, administrator, it, you mentioned the, the, the point on attribution. Uh, General Raymond, um, are you responsible for attribution of uh, other nation or other players? You might not recognize whether they're a nation or a, or, or a commercial or a subversive organization, but who's responsible for maintaining the security of national and allied assets in space? And how do both your organizations uh, sure. that out? If, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Bryce, I'll, I'll jump in Go first ahead. here and then... Uh, um, so first of all, uh, the answer to your question, who's responsible for on the on securing that domain? That's the United States Space Command commander. That is signed in the in Unified Command Plan by the president. That says here are the missions that are that are set for that command. Up until a few weeks ago, I was both the Space Force Chief and the U.S. Space Command commander. Today, those are two different people. I'm the Space Force Chief, and and General Jim Dickinson. Uh, uh, is the commander of U.S. Space Command. So he's responsible for that. My job is to organize, train, and equip uh, to provide him the capabilities to be able to uh, conduct that mission. I think uh, Mr. Bryce and I would, and I would both, uh, again, I'll, I don't want to speak for him, but I, I guarantee you he will say that um, uh, we both uh, want to live up to the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, from my perspective, uh, if you look at what's in the Outer Space Treaty, it's not all that limiting. It says, you know, you won't put a nuclear weapon in space and, and you, uh, you won't use uh, the moon, you know, for military operations, uh, if you will, and other celestial bodies. Short of that, it's the wild, wild west. And so I do believe that there is common interest between both NASA and the Space Force to develop norms of behavior. Now, they might be different because there's distinct mission sets. But as we, as we work those with our partners and some of those being the same partners and if you look at if you look at some of the folks that we're partnering with that are very early in their space programs the space programs that they have are more of a nasa equivalent than a military equivalent and so i really believe there's some synergies there that as nasa develops uh their thoughts on uh, norms of behavior for the artemis program uh and as we develop uh working very closely with our partners uh, where we want to go to with norms of behavior for national security space, that there's an intersection there that, that would be of value to, to share uh, to, and to discuss back and forth between the two organizations. And Congressman or Administrator, back over to you. 
<laughs> it's all right. It happens all the time. Um, okay, so I, th I think I'm in, I'm in full agreement with uh, with with what General Raymond said. Um, I think we're both um, very committed to the Outer Space Treaty and and adhering to the principles of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, there's a couple of things where I think NASA um, could could be uh, maybe more forward leaning, and that is, um, you know, when you think about the liability convention of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, it's it's really been it's really been tested once. Uh, there was a, a satellite that re-entered and hit Canada, and there was some some uh, some uh, damages paid from one country to the, to the other. That's the only, and that was decades and decades ago. Um, the 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 question is, um, you know, today we're seeing we're seeing you know satellites break apart, and we're seeing you know things get jammed, um, and 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 the question is, can can we test the liability convention convention in a more robust way? Um, because the Outer Space Treaty is not just, you know, for fun and games. It's it's intended to actually modify behavior in space. And if if we're not testing the liability convention, then it's really not worth the paper that it's written on. Um, so I think we need to we need to be maybe more forward leaning on 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 ensuring that the Outer Space Treaty is adhered to. It's also true, you know, when you think just a, you know, two or three weeks ago, we announced that we're going to actually buy um, lunar regolith. Uh, NASA is going to procure commercially um, some lunar soil, if you will. So we're sending, we're sending what we call commercial lunar payload services, CLIPS, to the moon. We want to go to the moon with small instruments, um, and we're going to buy some lunar soil. It is absolutely true that under the Outer Space Treaty, you cannot appropriate the moon for national sovereignty, and we don't want to appropriate the moon for national sovereignty. But we also believe that um, when we think about you know, how, you know, how we operate over international waters, for example, I'm a Navy pilot by trade, how we operate over international waters, um, we operate due regard. Um, you don't own the airspace in which you fly. Think about about how we operate in international waters to extract tuna, for example, or to extract energy, oil. Um, just because you extract tuna from the ocean doesn't mean that you own the ocean. Just because you extract oil from the ocean doesn't mean you own the ocean. You operate over international in international airspace and, and, and on international waters due regard. And I think that same policy should apply on the moon. Just because you extract a resource from the moon, what we're interested in is the water ice, we have found hundreds of millions of tons of water ice. Water ice is life support. It's air to breathe. It's water to drink. It's also hydrogen. Hydrogen, of course, is the same rocket fuel that powered the space shuttles and will power SLS. It's the most, it's, it's hundreds of millions of tons of hydrogen on the surface of the moon. Let's use it. Um, but, but the utilization of a resource on the moon is not the same thing as national appropriation. In fact, we've got many years of law and precedent that would indicate that you can use a resource and not appropriate you know, that territory for national sovereignty. So when we look at the Outer Space Treaty, I think it's important for us to, um, to make sure that it is being defined appropriately. And it's also true that in this particular case, I was in the House of Representatives in 2015 when we passed the, American, uh, the, the, the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. Um, and in that, we, we actually put in the bill, we defined um, how the United States of America will interpret the Outer Space Treaty to include that we can extract resources from the surface of the moon, and those resources can ultimately be sold, you know, and and purchased by private entities and people. Um, and 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 by the way, that was that passed the House with strong bipartisan support. It passed the Senate with strong bipartisan support, and it got signed into law by President Obama back in 2015. So I, I think we're on on very solid ground there. But I do think. It is important for NASA as an institution um, to, to make sure that we are 100% in compliance with the Outer Space Treaty. But as General Raymond said, it's, it's pretty vague in so many areas. So if, if we don't define it, somebody else will, and their interests might not align with ours. So we've got to make sure that we're, we're very active in, in defining you know, some of those uh, provisions in the Outer Space Treaty. All right, thanks very much. Uh, General Raymond. Um, what are some of the Space Force mission requirements above GEO and uh, cis lunar space 
um, as distinct from NASA's mission requirements? Um, and how well are you and uh, NASA working together on the technical challenges of operating above geo, uh, such as navigation, communications, and so on and so forth? So um, again, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, the, our mission is to organize, train, and equip, provide capabilities to U.S. Space Command to operate. If you look at the AOR that U.S. Space Command has to operate in, it is a, it's a very vast AOR. I mean, 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface and higher. It goes well beyond geosynchronous orbit. And so obviously we are looking to, uh, looking uh, beyond those orbits uh, to be able to conduct the national security space mission that we're going to, uh, that U.S. Space Command is going to have to conduct. And so areas that we are focusing on, uh, for example, as an example, would be space domain awareness. And we are working a close partnership with NASA uh, to develop the domain awareness necessary to support their efforts and to also support our national security uh, efforts uh, going forward. And so uh, communications, you, you talked about that as well. And, and, and we've, we have some really strong technology uh, roadmaps and partnerships uh, that, are, that are developing and that are, are being uh, further integrated to show that intersection where as NASA goes out to the moon, for example, that we can collaborate with on areas that would be beneficial for our national security space mission. Again, two distinct missions, but we, we rely on similar things. You gotta be able to communicate. You have to understand what's going on in the domain around. Uh, you have to be able to navigate, you know, precision navigation and timing. Uh, and so all of those things out at beyond what, what we have traditionally operated in, which is geosynchronous orbit and, and below, if you will, now, uh, now are expanded. And that expansion, uh, again, is, is enabled by a close partnership with NASA. Excellent. Uh, another interesting topic, uh, one that people, uh, it was coming back into the, into the news, and that's the subject of nuclear power use for space applications. It can certainly bring out passion in the discussion of both the pros and cons. Uh, and as an aside, so you might get a chuckle out of this, I uh, actually did my sixth grade science fair project on nuclear space propulsion back in the early 60s. Uh, wow, that's that's an impressive sixth grader right there. Yeah, well, I my dad had a little bit of influence on me, but I actually <laughs> remember pretty vividly uh, some of the designs of the uh, spacecraft and uh, ionization and uh, so on and so forth. But I won't bore you with the details. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm a fan, uh, and uh, Administrator uh, Bridenstine, you see nuclear propulsion as having extraordinary value. Uh, you've described it uh, as almost a must-do. So yes. could you share with us NASA's thinking about the future of its space applications and how we can help uh, a skeptical public understand how we can safely integrate nuclear propulsion into both NASA and military space programs? Absolutely. And, and I think General Raymond and I will both agree wholeheartedly that um, in, no, in no way would we ever consider putting weapons of mass destruction in space, which is fundamentally prohibited by the Outer Space Treaty? So I want to be clear, that is, that is not what, what this is. Um, what, what we're interested in doing, if you look at traditional chemical rockets, um, when we go to Mars, which we are going to Mars, when we go to Mars, it's, a, it's basically a nine-month journey to get to Mars when Earth and Mars are aligned on the same side of the sun. And then, and then after the, you're there, you're no longer in alignment, which means you have to wait two years before you can come home because that's the next time Earth and Mars will be on the same side of the sun. So that's a, that's a lot of radiation exposure. I mean, lots of radiation exposure and, and could be very damaging for the human system. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how to get there faster. Um, and there's ways to do that. And those ways include using nuclear propulsion. So first of all, there's, there's nuclear um, nuclear thermal propulsion, which is basically heating up hydrogen. Um, but propulsion has never changed. <laughs> um, it's, it's basically the same. It's force equals mass times acceleration. So you take a, you know, a mass of something and you accelerate it out the back of a rocket um, and, and it, it shoots you the other direction. So it's basically Newton's laws of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction and force equals mass times acceleration. So Newton's laws of motion apply today as they did you know, in the 1950s. What, what we can do today though, is we can, get, we can get more speed by using nuclear power to heat the hydrogen and accelerate it out the back of a rocket. 
Now, there, we're limited as far as nuclear, propul nuclear thermal propulsion goes because all of that, all of that, that chemical still comes in contact with the, with the skin of the rocket, which um, there's, there's a limitation from a material science perspective on how much thrust you can get from nuclear thermal using hydrogen. Um, however, if you talk about nuclear electric, um, you know, I know the Space Force has, has been using nuclear electric propulsion for, you know, for you know, the position of the satellites, for example. We are developing scaled up nuclear, or not nuclear, um, I should, solar electric, I should say solar. Space Force has used solar electric for commercial satellites and other things. We're, we're using solar electric for the gateway. We're building a space station in orbit around the moon. We call it the gateway. It's gonna be a really scaled up um, you know, solar electric propulsion for the purposes of maneuver around the moon so we can get to any part of the moon anytime we want. Um, but, but even more importantly is how, how do we go from basically uh, solar electric to nuclear electric? So when we talk about electric propulsion, we're talking about accelerating ions, uh, accelerating subatomic charged particles. So if force equals mass times acceleration and you're accelerating subatomic charged particles, that's not a lot of mass. What does that mean? That means you need a lot of acceleration. And so how do you get that acceleration? Well, well you do that with, with nuclear power and electricity um, and magnetism. And when you have that, when you have the magnetism, those subatomic charged particles um, never come in contact with the skin of the spacecraft because they can be controlled with magnets. Um, and, and all of that is tremendous. So we're talking about accelerating subatomic charged particles to a percentage of the speed of light. The goal here, General Deptula, is to be able to travel to Mars in a matter of months, maybe two or three months, not nine months. Uh, the, the, and, and, and when you're at Mars and you're on, not on the same side of the sun anymore, how do we come home when we're on opposite sides of the sun? Well, you can use, you can use Venus as a, as a gravity assist with nuclear propulsion to do what we call an opposition class return mission from Mars when you're on opposite sides of the sun. So nuclear propulsion, thermal, nuclear electric, all of these technologies are gonna fundamentally transform our access to our own solar system. So we absolutely need to develop it. Um, and, and I know, um, but to be clear, this, these, these are not weapons grade materials at all. The, and, and, and they couldn't even be used for weapons if you wanted them to be used for weapons. This is about propulsion, pure and simple. Um, I will also say that you know, when we go to other worlds like the moon or Mars, we're gonna need power, <laughs> lots of power. And so there's, there's room for nuclear power on the surface of the moon and on, and on Mars as well. But to be clear, again, we're not we're not interested in putting any kind of weapons in space. Not wep not weapons of mass destruction, I should say. Not that NASA does weapons at all, but um, the Outer Space Treaty talks about a prohibition on weapons of mass destruction in space. Fascinating insights, and I think that that will help the public understand that you know there's a tangible there that you talk about in the context of shortening the amount of time that it takes to transit uh, between the, uh, the, the Earth and Mars. So thanks very much for that insight. Um, and I'll have to go back and dust off my sixth grade science fair project. <laughs> Send NASA my conclusions. Um, okay, <laughs> NASA's uh, Planetary uh, Defense Coordination Office is still only a few years old. And it currently works cooperatively with many government entities to mitigate the effects of potentially hazardous objects in space. Has NASA and the Space Force discussed at all how you all might collaborate on this mission? And you know, some have, have asked, might some of the mission set be shifted from uh, NASA to the uh, Space Force? Uh, General Raymond, care to comment? I, so I, you know, clearly that uh, that is a NASA, uh, you know, in those distinct mission sets, the, the planetary defense mission falls, uh, falls to NASA. But I, we do have capabilities that can help NASA, and specifically, you know, some some that I would highlight would be the the space uh, domain awareness. You know, there, there we have optical sensors, for example, that could help detect uh, potential threats, and then we have data sharing uh, arrangements with NASA 
be able to provide that data to NASA to assist them in being able to, to conduct that, that, that mission. So I do think uh, there is a partnership to be had. There is a partnership that exists today. We are all about sharing any information that we can, uh, that we pick up with our sensors uh, that, with a, that could use as a dual purpose to help uh, detect potential uh, threats from uh, voloids, for example, and, and share that data with NASA uh, to help them do their mission. Very good. Yeah, and I, I would, I would, I would agree with that. Um, I think one area, you know, NASA worked with the Space Force um, on um, integrating some algorithms into the Space Surveillance Telescope, which is it was in New Mexico. Now it's down in Australia, um, and and you know they're they're doing space domain awareness. We're looking, as General Raymond said, we're looking for bolides that could collide with the Earth, um, and having our algorithm and their system enables us to to see things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see. So there's collaboration there. Um, and I would also say, you know, when NASA, when we're going to the moon here by 2024, we're gonna have humans on the moon. We're gonna have a number of experiments robotically on the moon um, as early as 2021. Um, and, and in 2022, 2023, we've got a lot of robotics going to the moon in the coming years. Um, and I think, you know, when we think about the sensors that, that we put on the moon, what NASA is interested in, we, we're, we are interested in buying data, which, which means we don't want to purchase, own, and operate the hardware, but we want to buy data. And the reason we want to buy data is because you know, if, if you put an optical sensor, for example, on the moon, which is an extremely stable platform, you know, we can use that optical sensor to detect you know, exoplanets around other stars because it's, it's such a stable platform, the moon that we can see the flicker of a star in exceptionally faint ways, which means if a planet circles in front of a star, we can, we can detect it in a way that you couldn't detect from a free flyer in space. And we can't detect it you know, from Earth because of the, the, uh, the atmosphere and, and, and other reasons. So, so the moon has valuable, a lot of value there, and you know, NASA's interested in buying data. And the reason we want to buy data is because then other agencies can also buy the data. The Department of Energy is, you know, they were, they're interested. <laughs> they made an announcement just the other day. They, they're going to do an RFP to put, you know, sensors either on or around the moon uh, to, to better understand physics. You know, they have a, a, a mission to understand high energy physics, high energy particles. Um, and, and of course, NASA is partnering with the Department of Energy on, on those kind of activities. So when we think about, um, you know, very low frequency radio telescopes, when we think about optics on the moon, the moon is a platform for all sorts of uh, really situational awareness capabilities to include the ability to see objects orbiting the moon. We're going to need, you know, we talk about space traffic management around the earth. If you look at all the stuff that we're sending to the moon, not just the United States, but, you know, Russia and China and India and Israel, all of the objects that are going to be orbiting the moon, landing on the moon, you know, we're going to have to do we're going to have to do space situational awareness and space traffic management around the moon, if you can imagine that, um, or else it's going to become very dangerous around the moon as well. So, um, so we want NASA wants to be a data purchaser, um, and then and then those kind of platforms would be available for other agencies to purchase data as well for their own purposes and and task for you know, different mission sets. So I think, I think there's, I think there's room. I'm, you know, I'm thinking futuristically here, uh, but I think, you know, with, with the various agencies responsible for deep space, I think there could be a lot of room on the moon for these kind of activities. If you look at, uh, you know, our focus on space situational awareness, it's a big data challenge. I mean, if you look at the numbers of objects that we track today uh, and, and the hundreds of thousands of observations that we take every day, to keep the domain safe for all. And all those observations we share broadly with our partners and with those that have sharing agreements, it's a big data challenge. And so one of the big focus areas for the Space Force has been about building the data infrastructure that we can take multiple sources of data and, and put them together at multiple classification levels and then provide the analysis on top of that data to help us solve some of the tough challenges. And when you're looking at, at the size of the space domain and the volume of space that you have to have awareness of and the speed of which those objects maneuver and, or orbit, uh, it's a really tough challenge. And, and we are also very focused on, on being able to harness that data. 
Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you for those insightful uh, comments. Um, we've now come to the end of this segment of our uh, discussion. Uh, and as an alert to our listeners, um, our next event is next week on uh, Thursday, the 1st of October, when the Mutual Institute is going to roll out our new policy paper on a treatable and or reusable unmanned aerial vehicles. Now, we're now going to open our session to questions from the audience who've been listening to our conversation. As a reminder to our listeners, you can participate in the Q&A by using the raise hand function on the device. And please, when I call on you, uh, unmute your mic and state your name and affiliation. Uh, you can also submit questions in writing using the Q&A function. Uh, and I'm going to kick off with one of those because we have a very good one from uh, Joey Roulette. And it's for General Raymond. Uh, General Raymond, how does the U.S. balance its defense against Russia with NASA's interest of sustaining its relationship with Moscow on the International Space Station? Would the Space Force like to see Russia collaborate on the Artemis program? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's a long history here, even in the Cold War, in the height of the Cold War, there was great collaboration uh, in the civil sector. I mean, there's always been strong collaboration uh, with uh, with uh, Russia and, and NASA. And I think uh, I think that's a, a benefit for our nation. And, and I think it's something that uh, should continue. I, I, I'll turn that over to Administrator Bridenstine for more, but I, I think there's, I think that's one area, even even in areas where when our countries disagree, there's always been uh, agreement on uh, and partnership on the civil use of space. So um, obviously, you know, next month, I guess in November, we're celebrating 20 years of Russian cosmonauts and NASA astronauts living and working together on the International Space Station. So that really is a monumental achievement of diplomacy when you think about all of the, the, the terrestrial challenges that the two nations have. So I, I do think, you know, it's, um, it's a channel of communication. It's an important um, kind of diplomatic tool. I would also say, as, as General Raymond said, we go back to 1972. Uh, we we're high, in the height of the Cold War and we had the Apollo Soyuz program, or if or if you're if you're Russian, you know they call it the Soyuz Apollo program, um, which was kind of a, a groundbreaking effort of of collaboration. Then you know we had the the shuttle Mir program uh, where they built the space station Mir. We built the space shuttle. We collaborated there. Um, that was in the in the 80s um, and and 90s, uh, and and now we've got the space station program. Um, so there's a lot of history here. Um, I, certainly, I, I know the, the, the Space Force has a very different mission than NASA, but as far as a, a tool of diplomacy, I, I think, I think we're, we're, doing, we're doing good by our nation. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, uh, your answer reminded me we had Gen General Tom Stafford come uh, speak to Mitchell Institute about that mission. It was just absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. So from yeah. both, uh, both of you, it's a great point on uh, partnering with the folks that uh, we seem to be able to do better in space than we do in terms of relationships uh, inside the atmosphere. Um, let me turn it over to Sandra Irwin for uh, her question. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you, Administrator Bridenstine and General Raymond for, for this briefing. I have a question for General Raymond. Um, China has not been mentioned in this discussion so far, and I know that you've um, <clears throat> raised some concerns about uh, China uh, and their behavior in space. And I was just wondering, how would you suggest moving forward that the US should work with China to make space more secure and deal with some of the concerns that you have? Thanks. You know, the, uh, first of all, I'd just say that um, the, the United States Space Force is, is reaching out and has very, very strong partnerships uh, across the globe with like-minded nations to operate in a safe and professional manner. We share data back and forth. Again, as I mentioned uh, up front, um, uh, that the partnership aspect of what we've done uh, with the Space Force and really leading up to the Space Force over the last last few years, and when we set up US Space Command, we we developed a combined command. I mean, we, we are op we're not just sharing data with our partners, we're operating together. We've got a very strong partnership base. We share information broadly across the world. And I would just call on all nations to um, operate in a manner that uh, reflects the safe and professional use of space. 
Administrator, do you have any, any comments about China? So NASA is uh, prohibited from cooperating with China um, in any bilateral way, and, and we're prohibited by law. Um, and so I would imagine that, um, you know, that, that could change um, if, if their behavior were to change. Um, but uh, un, until, until Congress uh, passes a different law, or lets the current appropriation, it's, it was done in an appropriation bill, it's done annually in an appropriation bill until that expires and Congress doesn't, doesn't you know, reinstitute it. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be partnering in a bilateral way. Thank you. Okay, how about Teresa Hitchens? Hi, this is Teresa Hitchens with Breaking Defense and thanks to everyone for um, doing this today. I have a two part question. Um, first, for, for Administrator Bridenstein, um, my question is about uh, lunar resources. And you uh, um, sort of made the comparison to extracting fish from the ocean, but resources on the moon are finite. Um, so anything you take, you mine or you remove, they're finite resources, and that's different than fish. Um, fish will repopulate. Um, lunar regolith is not going to repopulate. So how do you work that with the, our international partners? And for General Raymond, as you look beyond um, GEO to cislunar operations, can you explain to me what you see as the Space Force's mission in protecting or defending commercial interests who might run into trouble in space or on the moon or in Mars. That is not a mission that was traditionally in Air Force Space Command or the Air Force's bucket of mission sets. Um, I don't see it in the current uh, doctrine paper that you put out. So I wondered if you could explain that mission to me. Thank you. So a great, great question. Um, uh, as far as the, um, you know, the, the lunar resources question, uh, a, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, the the resources that that come from the ocean that would be, would be energy are also finite, um, and yet and yet we're able to extract those resources from the ocean. And if you the, the the fundamental law that applies is if you apply your sweat and your equity and your investment, your capital to extracting a resource, um, you you receive the benefit of owning the property right of that resource while you don't also own the ocean. Um, so that's that's the fundamental property right that 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 exists, whether it's fish or energy from from the ocean. Um, on the moon, that same principle, in in my view, and of course passed by the United States Congress with bipartisan support, signed by President Obama, that's that's the way we have interpreted the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and I will tell you that we've we've had broad, you know, consensus that this is this is a a, a um, an appropriate way to explore and develop the moon. Now, if we get to a day where we're running out of resources on the moon, I will tell you that NASA will have done an amazing job. Um, that's we're not anywhere, of course, near 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 that. Um, but but in 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 my view, we need to make sure that we set the regulatory certainty to encourage the capital formation necessary for commercial companies to go and do these types of activities. Um, and, and I will also say, look, we talk about, you know, rare earth metals on earth, platinum group metals. These are asteroid impacts from billions of years ago. And these asteroid impacts, of course, are, um, you know, today on earth, they're, 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 they call them rare earth metals. They're very trace when you find them. It's because the earth has an active geology. The Earth has an active atmosphere, an active hydrosphere. So nothing is today where it was billions of years ago when it collided with the Earth. And that's if it could even get through the atmosphere to begin with. We saw, of course, what happened with Chelyabinsk. That was a that was a big asteroid, 20 meters wide, and of course it exploded, you know, you know, miles above the surface of the Earth. So it's really hard for asteroids to actually make impact with the Earth. You look at the moon. The moon is riddled with asteroid impacts and it continues to be impacted regularly. The earth and the moon, we fly through the same piece of sky. Um, if we have rare earth metals, you know, those, those same asteroid impacts have impacted the moon. The difference is on the moon, um, there is no active geology, there is no active hydrosphere, there is no active atmosphere. So anything that impacted the moon billions of years ago 
is today right where it was billions of years ago. In other words, there could very well be, and I'm not saying there is because I don't know, but there very well could be trillions of dollars, tens of trillions of dollars in large deposits of platinum group metals on the moon. And if that's the case, um, that if somebody were to be able to capitalize on those discoveries, it could change the balance of power on Earth. I'm not saying that's the case. By the way, it is very ex expensive to get to the moon. It's very expensive to extract those resources. It's very ex expensive to get them home. So the business case may or may not close. But I do think it's important to set the regulatory certainty necessary to, to capitalize um, and encourage that activity. Um, and, and, and the same principles apply at the moon that would apply uh, over international waters. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, unfortunately, we've come to the end of this uh, aerospace nation. Uh, and I'd like to thank again, uh, the uh, administrator uh, Bridenstein and uh, General Raymond. You both are doing magnificent work and we wish you all the best for continued success. So to you and to our audience, from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day. And uh, thank you very much, and Administrator Bernstein, thanks for joining us this morning, and thanks to the Mitchell Institute. And for Teresa that asked that last question that I didn't get a chance to answer, we'll reach out to you and I'll get you an answer. But uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Yeah, take care. Real pleasure, General Deptula. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you.